You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 76 of the Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living a life in ruins. I am your host, Carlton Gover, and I am joined by my co-hosts, Connor Johnnan and David Howe. Tonight, we have the extreme pleasure of having Dr. Jesse Toon and Dr. Shane Miller return to the show to talk about a uh, recent archaeological literary happening that has occurred in our field within the last, last week. For those that don't know or may not remember, Dr. Toon appeared on episode 50. We had our Settlers of Saruti episode where it was the first time we had uh, Jesse and Shane both on the show to talk about the Saruti Mastodon site. That was episode 37. And uh, then Shane first appeared on the show like back in uh, episode 2021. So these are longtime guests. We're very happy to have him back on tonight. Shane, how, how are you doing this evening? I'm living the dream, man. Dreaming to live. Pretty sure you said that last time, too. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's my go-to, man. Like, I live in the South. Everybody's like, how you doing? How you doing? And I don't know. It's like, you're limited on options of what you can say back. So that's just my go-to. Fair enough. Uh, well, representing Colorado, how are you doing today, uh, Dr. Toon? Fantastic. You know, Monday, five weeks into the semester and nice, cool, crisp fall weather. So, yeah, loving it down here. Excellent. Well, once again, it's a pleasure, pleasure having you guys back on on such short notice, just like last time. So today we are talking about a uh, recent article that came out regarding footprints in White Sands National Park and what that means for the field. So Dr. Toon, would you be able to provide our listeners with a brief summary of what's going on? Sure. So just a few days ago, this paper was published by a whole research team led by uh, Matthew Bennett and uh, a lot of other people. Basically, this is one of a, a series of papers by many people of the same research team that have come out in the last few years talking about track weights, feet print of various animals and critters down in White Sands. And Previous papers have shown the relationship and talked about the relationship of human feet print and other animals left along the shoreline of Paleo Lake Otero. But this paper that just came out is really the first time that the geochronology has been nailed down. And they were using radiocarbon dates and uranium series dates to say that there are human feet print trackways that date to sometime between about 21 and 23,000 years ago. So if these trackways hold up to muster, past muster with the archaeological community, then it's going to force us to rethink what we thought we already knew about a range of topics from when people first show up to, in North America to questions of human predation, of megafauna, to genetic research, to, um, to a whole host of, of other um, related topics. And so that's kind of the, the gist of, of this new paper and some of the implications that may come out of it. And uh, so, Dr. Miller, um, before we, like, had you on, we, we are in a big group text um, kind of talking about this stuff because it's an important to our field and we're trying to figure out what's, what's going on. And you had mentioned that you had actually been – to White Sands and kind of seen some of this stuff. Do you mind kind of describing like the environment and where this kind of place is? So when I was in grad school, I, uh, I got to spend a couple summers as Vance Holiday's field assistant. So Vance Holiday is one of the co-authors of this, of this piece. He's a geoarchaeologist and he has this massive coring rig that he basically goes around the Southwest doing geoarchaeology for a whole bunch of folks and then his own projects. And the area that he was getting really interested in was the Tularosa Basin around White Sands. So it was the first time going there with him was the first time I'd ever been there. And I can say with like a hundred percent certainty, like I've done some archeology span in some weird places. This was the weirdest place I've ever been in my life. So you've got like these like sand dunes that are made. They're not like regular sand. Like that's quartz sand. They're gypsum sand crystals in the middle of this valley in southern New Mexico. And 
it's this wonderful like national monument that's managed by the national park service then all around it is like layers and layers of military industrial complex and so while we were there they had under they had uncovered like one of their first trackways or one of the trackways that like kind of got the ball rolling and so we stayed within the monument and when we first drove in the dust was like binding from smoke from a forest fire to the west so it was like it looked like hoth driving through it it was just like it was the weirdest weird it was crazy and and then the next day we got up and we go and we see these trackways and we have to go like out and around not through like the main part of the park. We had to go around to the northern edge of the park. So we had to go in through the Air Force Base that's adjacent to it. And we end up crossing this like, it looks like a road with a metal rail through the middle of it. And we found out that that's where they tested a lot of rockets in the Cold War. Like a lot of like basic experiments to see like what happens if you put a human being in a cockpit and you go really fast. And so it was one of the archaeologists or somebody out there was telling us stories about coming across the pictures of them, like sedating, like a monkey or a bear or something and putting it in a cockpit and put it on this rail and sending it down this 10 mile track. And, at, and just to see what happens is very America cold words. It was wild. So then we get to this place and they're like, whatever you do, don't point your camera that way. And they're like, okay. And it's like, for real, like Black Hawk helicopters will come down. Like that stuff over there don't exist. I'm like, well, all right, this is wild. And so we hike out there and they've got one of these trackways uncovered. And it was one of the first ones that they had uncovered. It was like the neatest little landscape because you're right next to this paleo lake. So now it's like this a little bit wet, but not really like flat. I think like salt lake kind of like flat next to it at the and you got the wind whipping across it and on the eastern side of that lake it's the wind's blowing so hard it's blowing the the top of this substrate off and it's leaving the reverse impressions of footprints so it's like uh because they're more compressed and so they're more resistant to being blown away, at least in this one area that I, I got to see. So you see like these little like, well, there's mammoth footprints, there's camelid footprints. And they had a trackway that they thought was human initially that turned out to be a sloth trackway. And that was what they were working on on the time that I went out there. And then the next summer we went back and they had one of the trenches open that they mentioned in the article. And so Vance was like all excited about it because as a Jew archaeologist, there's nothing more exciting than a trench in the ground with nice stratigraphy. And he was just all about it. And so before long, it's like, you know, it's getting about noon in Arizona or New Mexico and like early June. And he's got me in there with like one of those things you use to like, I don't know, it's, it's meant for like pounding posts in, but he was using it to pound osl samples so it was like it's probably the closest i've ever felt to like being in an like an ant underneath a magnifying glass than in a completely white trench in the middle of the day in southern new mexico where it was like the one time i looked at vance and i was like dude i like 99.9 percent of the time i've had a blast doing stuff with you this is the point one percent. Like this is miserable, <laughs> but I don't know. It's like such a weird, weird place. So of course it come up with like a weird site like this. Of course it would be there. It's the weirdest place. Of course. And so for our listeners, um, we're talking about um, specifically the report titled "Evidence of Humans in North America During the Last Glacial Maximum" by Bennett at all, twenty twenty one. So. Um, while we're talking about this, it's going to be helpful to have this up because we'll, we'll refer to figures throughout it. So going back to you, Dr. Toon, you mentioned in your brief synopsis of what's going on that this has the potential, if it holds up, to seriously changing our interpretations, our understanding of human migration into the Americas. So 
what is the date on these footprints? One, and how'd they get that date? So the dates on the footprints in the recent paper are about 21 to 23,000 years old. And they ended up getting there with radiocarbon dating some aquatic plant seeds and kind of cross-checking that with uh, uranium series dating as well. So they're using two different dating techniques to essentially complement one another and and kind of cross-check one another. And there's always going to be questions with radiocarbon dating of aquatic plants and, and seeds because of issues like reservoir effects and things like that with the radiocarbon. Uh, And that's one reason I think that they ended up using additionally the um, uranium series dates as well. Um, And yeah, it it all is kind of pointing to this time frame about 2000 years that these feet print were put down at different points over 2000 years, sometime uh, between 21 and 23,000 years ago. So, they they use they bracket they use bracketing right so they dated seeds found in sediments below the footprints and seeds found above the footprints to create that bracket of like it has to be in, if it's between these two layers then it's you know younger than the and than the bottom layer but older than the top layer what what were they dating for the uranium I think that's like directly on the gypsum grains on the gypsum sand. It's like similar to OSL where you're you're dating the I guess the radiation loss or something. Yeah, this is like one of these methods that I I admit to not being up on. And it's like one of these like holes in my archaeological knowledge because it's like, you know, not something that I that's used regularly in my neck of the woods. That's what they used to date Cerruti too, right? Or was that potassium argon or something? Uh, <laughs> it was I don't something think like, he, I don't think he meant for that to be a joke, but that's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But I mean, that, um, that's that's a good point that uh, Dr. Miller brings up because like, you know, and, and if you're working within 50,000 years, so that means if you're working within North America, you're generally using radiocarbon dating. Something like the, the uranium dating seems more like something you'd find in paleoanthropology. or And that's like how David alluded to Saruti. Saruti was so much older that they, the half-life of radiocarbon dates was just shot. So they had to use a different isotope. But that part of it seems fairly straightforward to me, like what exactly they're dating. They got those two bracketing sets of dates on those seeds and from what i remember from that one trench i mean i'm not gonna say map that whole entire trench in my one couple day experience out there pounding away at a profile advance onto the rest of the site but like it was wild you could see like a line of those seeds like uh, from that whatever wetland plant that is like it was and they look like they were like from last year I mean, it was remarkable. And and they were like, oh, yeah, those things are like last glacial maximum wetland plant. And I was like, that's kind of cool. Don't see that every day. Yeah, that's really interesting. And if if you guys are looking at the article, figure two will show you the stratigraphy and where those dates are from. So you can kind of see the bracketing that's happening there and how actually really tight those dates are. That's something that, like Dr. Miller said, that is like it's it's probably good and there's not any issues they're unburnt seeds so there's not not any sort of issues with burning or anything like that so that's well, go ahead i i guess the one issue that that i've seen some chatter about is reservoir effects because they are wetland plants and again you know like i i defer to radiocarbon expertise to other colleagues on this but as far as i know like that's always like a recurring problem like are are you are these plants susceptible to uptaking old carbon and giving erroneously old dates so the brilliant thing that they did though was they had this uranium series set of dates that aren't organic material dependent and they seem to converge so they're like two independent lines of evidence like the only thing that i would have maybe done is maybe use two labs radiocarbon labs but like if you got u series and and a radiocarbon sequence that all kind of converge in some ways that might just be like a redundant waste of money too i mean you've got that part of it seems sound you know and it's i have a hard time poking holes in that um what do you think 
I've seen a number of you know people at Radio Carbon Labs really around the world talking about this over the last few days, and and I think by and large most people are okay with the dates. That's refreshingly not one of the the things that's yeah. going to be uh, hotly debated about this particular site. And you know, like Shane was saying, the reservoir effect is something to to consider. But even if that is is it play here, it's probably not going to skew the dates in this particular context by, say, 10,000 years, right? And and then, yeah, if you have the youth series dates as well. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, I'm okay with the dates being accurate for the surfaces for those individual strata um, that, that are at the site. Do we want to talk about that? Rachel, how do you say that? R H A R A C H A L Rachel at all? Do you guys read that? Did I dump that in the folder for you guys? You did. Are um, right, you guys? Ah, oh, you guys give me the grad student face. Oh, I just saw it. <laughs> no, um, I just I was, saw it. I, was, oh, I, 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 I looked at I the abstract. I was looking at the timer. We're already at eighteen minutes, so I was trying to segue into. Let's save that for the next segment. Um, I would also like to not in any pun intended, like get into the feet next. uh, (laughs) This is really important. And like, I want like, all right, I'll ask next question or next, uh, next session. We'll call the Tarantino one. We'll be right back to segment two of a life in ruins podcast episode 76. Welcome back to episode 76 of a life in ruins podcast. We're here with Dr. Jesse Toon, Dr. Shane Miller and the other guys. And we are going to talk about the feet and the footprints that are in the actual article, you know, the, the feet at hand. I'm no, 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 they're not in hand. Off. They're just feet. They're on legs. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> actually, someone commented uh, on one of my pages saying, we actually don't know if they were attached to, it's just feet. Like, were they attached to legs? And I thought that was really funny. <laughs> That's deep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just know their feet. But anyway, Jesse, in the inner in room, we were talking about the different way they were presenting in the article. Can we talk talk about that? Sure. So the figure that I'm referring to is figure one in the 2021 article. And there's a lot going on, right? There are a number of pieces to this figure, but the most distinctive imprints of presumably human feet are in sections B and E of that first figure, number one there. And I've talked to a lot of people and they're like, wait, what is happening with with these images Uh, what am i looking at and ultimately these are impressions right Uh, they're impressions that have been excavated of the tracks and so in spite of what maybe the shadowing looks like these are not actually sticking up above the surface around to the edges of the feet but they're actually imprints into the to the substrate that has been excavated out okay so for I guess for layman listening, if like you haven't dug in an archaeological site, when you're peeling off these layers to get to these feet, would they have been already indented or would it, was it like something we scooped out to get the indentation? Well, the feet would have been, would have created an indention into the ground that in subsequent years would have filled up with sediment. And then once archaeologists found the the outline of these individual little impressions that may be feet print, then the archaeologists went in and, and actually excavated the sediment back out of those impressions. Okay. So there is probability that like some of the, like the, the shape of the feet could have been like pulled out like a little too much. You know, that explain like the toes are weird or. Yeah. I mean, that's always an issue with excavating features in archaeology, right? Whether yeah. it's a pit feature or a, or a hearth or something like that. Anytime that, there's an impression or a hole in the ground that gets filled up with sediment. And then archaeologists come back hundreds or thousands of years later and dig out that sediment. It is definitely a delicate situation to only remove the sediment from the original impression into the ground. Right. Yeah. And depending on the type of sediment that can be made much more complicated. Right. And a really like hard, dense clay, it's a little bit easier, but in softer, sandier sediments, potentially like at white sands, that job is going to be a lot more complicated. You're 
ultimately going to be removing, you know, a couple of sand grains at a time until you get yeah. to the edge of what these impressions originally looked like and how easy that is to determine um, is, is maybe a question at, at play here. Okay. Yeah. Cause I would imagine most people looking at the news article, just glancing through, would just think there's footprints laying in the desert. So yeah. I just want to clear that up. So I guess we, we had talked about this seeing toes, is weird <laughs> in like in like the scheme of like all of all of archaeology that we've seen so far having toe impressions is not something we normally see from Latoli, you know millions of years ago to to more current stuff is that generally correct yeah you know that's one of the things that really drew my attention to some of the figures in this 2021 paper to begin with were the toes, um, the, the level of detail in the toes. And there are a couple of different things that we could talk about there, right? Uh, some of the impressions have four, five, or even six toes, which humans are known to have occasionally <laughs> for various reasons. But while fossilized feet print, human feet print are one of the rarest things that exist in the archaeological record, this is not the first time that we've seen them, right? There are fossil human feet print going back at least 3.6 million years and, you know, all the way up to a couple of thousand years ago. And they're spread out throughout the world, right? Everywhere from parts of Africa to all over Europe to all over the Americas. And in most of those cases, nearly all of those cases we typically don't see the level of definition of detail as what mm -hmm. shows up in these feet print that have just been published on. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with the types of sediment that they're being imprinted into. But, you know, think about our lives today. We go to the beach, we, we go to the lake, we're walking barefoot in along a muddy shoreline or a sandy shoreline, turn around and look at your feet print, right? Chances are you're, you're probably sliding around a little bit. Sediment is stuck to the bottom of your feet as you're lifting them up and it's falling back down into that impression. And so it's less of a, of a factor of time that we don't see toes typically preserved, but more just, you know, what our feet print are like whenever we're walking barefoot across some of these kinds of surfaces. And that just stands out as, as unusual, to me in this paper. So this isn't the first time these footprints have been published. There's another article by Bennett called Walking in Mud, Remarkable Pleistocene Human Trackways from White Sands National Park. And this is in Coordinary Science Review uh, 249. And Dr. Miller, you were talking about some discrepancies between the 2020 article, the footprints that are shown there, and then what we're seeing in the 2021 piece. I mean, discrepancies may be a hard word, but like, I'm trying to think of like a good way of putting it. Um, if I was rolling through this, I would definitely flag it for uh, a, another look. Because when you go through this 2020 piece and you look at all their human footprints in that one, there are no, again, it feels so weird especially, you know, in David Ian Howe's presence to keep zeroing back around to the toes. But there's no toes in the footprints on the Benadryl 21, on the human toes. And, you know, I was, I was out there and, you know, when you talk to those guys, this is not an easy thing to do. This is not an easy context to dig. So if you go to the 2020 article, you can see how faint, the outlines are of the footprints and then like the before and after the excavation. And this is, this is hard to tease out. So like a couple things there that I'm really just, you know, things I would need to, to see before I'm fully sold that this is, this is legit is a better, broader explanation for how they're uncovering these things, how they're delineating them. And then how they're excavating them and recording them to explain to me why in one article in 2020, 
there's nary a toe to be seen. And then the next year they put out an article that's got toes all over the place. Like what's what's so and it's specifically the cover photo of track four is where all the toes are at. And it makes me feel so dumb even saying that sentence, like zeroing in on something as minute as the toes. But to me, this it's enough to make me think if there's a problem, this is where the problem is. And it might be that this might be one of these situations in archaeology where we're still figuring out how to do this and trying to excavate, delineate and excavate a feature like this is actually really, really hard. And then telling it, it, how different it might be from a regular old human footprint to, I don't know, another bipedal species around out there like a sloth. They say it's easy because the adult sloth has like this claw that comes out that you can see that differentiates between a human foot and a sloth foot. But then again, when I was out there, they were convinced they had human footprints and then they changed their mind and said they were sloth. So are you saying they uh, vetoed their previous interpretation? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh. Well done, sir. <laughs> That's good. I, I'm looking at sloth versus human, and like the sloth ones are like, I would say quite crescent, whereas like the human ones, they look like hand, like cave handprints of feet. You know, like yeah. It's it's well, just. And just know. look at some of the the other human prints that don't have the toes so well defined and they are highly crescent shaped as well. Okay. So, and and just for clarification, the the 2020 article did not mention dating for them. That one was more centered on what footprint belongs to who between sloths, humans, the directionality of the footprints and what's going on. So they didn't really get into the dating in that one. Yeah. Yeah. I would really like, I'm just curious, like what would a juvenile sloth look like? Um, what would a juvenile sloth foot look like? Giant sloth foot look like? Pull that up, Jamie. Let me see. Sloth. <laughs> we need ourselves a Jamie. Uh, let's see. Is that like your joke of like your fake intern that you don't actually have? Uh, I'm going, not, I'm not yeah. in this joke, so I have no <laughs> it's, idea it's, what to talk about. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's got like an assistant and it's yeah. like, Jamie, pull that up. It's just like a meme. <laughs> Uh, uh, not cool enough to listen to Joe Rogan. <laughs> You're fine. He was sure talking about this about paper. This. A lot of I'm, people were tagging me on that one on Instagram. I, I listen to you guys. I don't listen to Joe Rogan. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Maybe yeah, sloth sorry. footprints. You know what? Those, yeah. <laughs> Those look well, like people feet. They look really <laughs> similar. Whoa, dude. Well, and we also, so there's that uh, 2018 article that you 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 gave us with um, by Bustos, mm-hmm. David Bustos, at all that shows the sloth and human footprints overlapping in these areas too. Mm-hmm. And these are all people on the same research team as well, right? Bustos is part of the, the last most recent couple of Bennett et al. papers as well. You know, and I, and I think in some ways it's like the difficulty in trying to like ask these questions is like, you don't want to be like, you don't want to be the jerk taking pot shots and making insinuation, insinuation, Insinuation. God, what's that word? Insinuations. Insinuations. Wow, it's it's late in the day. But it's also kind of like you just kind of have this mental checklist about in your head, like what would I need to see to convince me that one of these multiple working hypotheses are wrong? And so that was one of the ones that popped in my head was like, all right, like what's more likely a place where you have big sloths, you also have small sloths, or you have ice age humans running around the same landscape as sloths that are five, 6,000, 7,000 years older than like the oldest kind of controversial site, like Cooper's Ferry that a lot of people don't actually buy. That's like almost 10,000 years older than like, or uh, what, I don't know. Like it's, it's like the odds, like what, what are the odds? So, like, I don't think it's the dating or the chronology is a problem. Although, like, the the Rachel et al. paper that we had in the folder, they talked about, like, there could be some dynamic processes where you had some, like, erosion of older sediments. People step on those and then cover back up again. And it looks like they're all old, which I think this paper kind of blows it up. I don't think that that's a good, viable alternative 
I think it's if there's a problem, it's whether whether or not those are actually people feet making those footprints. So it was like a Tuscan Raider situation where they like walk over them. And they came back in larger numbers. Sand people walk in a single file to hide their numbers. <laughs> Didn't necessarily mean to do a joke, but like, so like what you're saying is in the other places, they. I don't like, know if you can say sand people. people. <laughs> no. I don't think you can oh. say Oh. I said Tuscan Raiders, right? No, no, Carlton said oh. sand people. But that's what they said. I'm quoting a movie. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so like, <laughs> over the footprint, I could see making different like impressions, but. Something I, I noticed in here is like there's two left feet and they're like right next to each other, two right feet. Are you talking about in the 2021 paper? Yeah, but it also could be two people like, st- I don't know. Yeah, that shows up in a couple of different places and, and it is a little bit easier to understand in the supplemental information. Okay. And ultimately, it, it's the same type of situation that's going on at Latole with. Uh, the famous Latoli trackways there with Australopithecus afarensis 3.6 million years ago. It's two individuals walking right beside one another and kind of in step with one another. And so both individuals are stepping right beside each other's left foot and right foot. Um, so it, yeah. it's actually two different um, okay. people. Yeah, That clears that up for me. So I'm score one for the paper. <laughs> You know, I, I'd just like to kind of add on something that Shane said. And, you know, both of us have been on here before talking about new papers that have come out. And there's always debate that is centered on, you know, some new research that's pushing boundaries and, and asking new questions. And that debate isn't necessarily at all people being vindictive, right? And and criticizing one another's, but it's just frankly the way that all science works, right? We're all constantly working together to think of alternative explanations and alternative interpretations of the data. And, you know, we all make mistakes. My God, I know I've made plenty of mistakes doing research and God, I hate going back and reading things that I've already written and published because they're riddled with with holes that, you know, other people have called me out on or I've caught myself. And so I I think that's really important for, you know, non-specialists, non-archaeologists to kind of keep in mind. It's not just that we're here being jerks saying, oh, we don't buy this or that, but we're just, you know, Trying to, to be good scientists is what it comes yeah. down to and trying to, to ask hard questions and think of alternative scenarios. I have to say, like, this is like one of the better looking cases in terms of how it's like framed and put together. Yeah. You know, it it's really like, is. like the whole dating thing, like so much of it is just like dating insight formation processes type questions that, you know, is it the dates right or is this like or the dates could be accurate within a jumbled context so it's not the problem with the dates it has the problem with the con this doesn't seem to be that case this is much more of are those really human toes or not like is that really human feet or not yeah it's really and, refreshing to be having one of these conversations and not talking about is that an artifact or not you know it, it, yeah. it is a new type of of evidence and data compared to many of the other sites. Sorry, Shane, I think it cut you off. No, I think it also comes back around like some of the other people talking about like, this is amongst the rarest of artifact classes, like human footprints, preserved human footprints. So if you think about how many times archaeologists have had a chance to kind of develop a battery of tests to make sure that we're not fooling ourselves. Yeah. We have like limited shots on goal. And so like in this case, it's kind of interesting that it's not even really a team of like archaeologists per se. They're biologists and some other folks who are out doing like vertebrate paleontology type questions that stumbled onto some things that look like human footprints that are making the case. So they got a little better battery of knowledge, I guess, on how to handle this. But like human footprints, that's like the rarest of the rare. And it seems like the other thing that like I thought was kind of fascinating was the number of tracks that they were finding. They found the one where they were taunting the sloth in uh, another paper that came out like a, a year or two ago. And then you got these trackways and there's enough people walking back and forth across this landform. And 
me and my colleague uh, that I work with at the Cobb Institute, Derek Anderson, we were going back and forth about this. And it's like, at what point do you do you have enough footprints where you stop thinking of this as like, you know, random footprints going across a pristine landscape and more like what you'd expect a crowded intersection to look like? Oh. <laughs> And imagine a crowded intersection when you get that many people walking back and forth without the ethos of picking up after littering. Wouldn't you expect to find some other stuff out there too? Especially if supposedly a bunch of those footprints are juveniles. It's not just like walking around, like from trying to get from point A to point B as quickly as you can. You're dragging your kids along with you. It's like at some point, how many footprints does it take before we start asking, where's the other stuff? There's got to be like a point where this, the, this, and I don't know if we're there yet. I don't know if they have enough footprints. I mean, they've got a lot, but they haven't uncovered a huge area. But at some point, don't you have to kind of be like, where's the rest of the stuff that we know people drag around behind them and leave all over regular archaeological sites that we don't have to like tilt our head and ask if, if that's an archaeological site or not. Let's, uh, let's get into that in the next segment. Cause I got, I got a few points on that. So that's what we'll do. We'll be right back with episode 76. Talk more about feet and welcome back to uh, episode 76 of life from his podcast. We're here with uh, Dr. Jesse Toon, Dr. Shane Miller, just real quick to start off this conversation. Can you imagine being David Bustos, the MPS park ranger? Who's, who's in charge of this circus, like out of all the MPS positions to be park ranger Bustos and to be involved with this must be like a federal agent's dream. You got someone else working on a missile silo in Wyoming. And then this guy's like, I have footprints, which you don't find anywhere else in the world. What do I do with this? Which I think is a testament to like all the articles that we were looking at the amount of interdisciplinary, how interdisciplinary it is, the amount of authors they brought on, which is, unlike the original Holland paper was just him and the other Holland, I think is a testament to like how careful they were trying to be. They brought in dendro geomorphologists. They had a whole sweep of people to look at this because I think they all understood the significance of what their dates were saying. I think that's how they brought in Vance. They were basically found out that Vance was looking at archeology span stuff around the park and Vance is looking at stuff on the park and made those connections and, they were like, yo, you know, come look at this. And they independently came to the same conclusion that those sediments were the same age. I think that's the backstory. I could be wrong on that. But so, I, it, yeah, it's like a cool, it's a cool paper. Um, you know, I, I have my frustrations reading through this stuff and I've got like a stack of like site reports from WPA days in the 1930s, TVA reports from the 1970s and eighties. And I grew up like reading those, like that's how you report a site and then trying to like tease out the information that I'm looking for. in these like compressed high impact journals and you got to like loop back to the supplemental material and you have this other question and it's actually in the supplemental material of two previous articles that they've written on. It is a little mind bending. It also makes me realize like this is how people can get off the rails and like reading COVID literature. You know, there was something wildly out of their cir circle of competence and trying to understand the layers of detective work. Sometimes you have to do to find questions that should be in the article, but are buried somewhere else because of page limits and word limits. For sure. I guess I want to ask you, uh, Dr. Toon, so what would you want to see from this team in the future? What would be your focus if you were leading this research team? You know, that's a really good question. And I think kind of like a number of us have already mentioned, the this paper, these specific track ways offer some of the most intriguing and compelling support for a last glacial maximum or, or pre-LGM period human occupation of the Western Hemisphere. I definitely do not envy the research team on this project because you have they have very little data to, to go by, right? It, it's the sediment, plain and simple, and, you know, some organic material to date in it, but Unlike most of these other early sites, you know, there are not artifacts to, to talk about. They're, they're just limited in, in the type of, of data to work with. I think we were talking about some of this during the, the last break, but 
you know, after a while, there become enough tracks, enough individual feet print, but enough track ways that, you know, we have to start asking questions about what does that tell us itself about the human behavior, right? It's one thing to say, okay, we got these purported feet prints that are really old. Cool. Great. But what does that actually tell us about the people, right? As archaeologists, that's what we're interested in to begin with, the people, not about the artifacts or, you know, the impressions of someone's foot. And so, you know, where are these feet print coming from? Where are they going to, right? You know, I I don't think we're that far away from, and, and I know they've been doing some geophysical work already down in White Sands to identify buried stratigraphic layers with some of these tracks, both human and, and other animals. But, you know, are we at the point technologically now that we can literally use some type of remote sensing equipment to trace out where these tracks are going and where they came from, right? If we can do that, then I think we're really close to resolving some of the questions about white sands anyways. Where is the rest of the material, right? Where are the actual sites and the artifacts that are associated with the people who purportedly left these tracks behind? I I think that would be a really interesting avenue of future research uh, in white sands. Yeah, had a lot of this question on like when I posted about this uh, the other day, like this paper, my synopsis of it you know, the first pre-Clovis versus Clovis and whatnot. And I just kept saying to people like, not that the Clovis pre-Clovis sites are always like wrong. They're just, uh, Bob Kelly brought up a great point saying like, you have this evidence with Clovis sites that like, you can see that there's like over 10,000 Clovis points discovered in the Americas. And like, they leave a distinct signature. Their sites kind of form in a very similar way. They're, they're Paleolithic people or Mesolithic maybe, but like- The data is patterned. Yeah, there you go. So it's consistent with each other. But with these Clovis, pre-Clovis sites, we have like the, you know, poop in the caves. We have seaweed at Monte Verde. Uh, you got this, these footprints. They're always kind of scant, unless you argue that Galt and Topper are like big complex occupations. But yeah, it, it, like, I forget where I was going with this, but essentially we have so much overwhelming evidence of Clovis being a complex culture here in North America that like we can't just like push that aside for these outliers. However, I think there's nothing wrong with saying that people were here before Clovis. It's just like Clovis is the the like, you know, the first time it was like popping off here, maybe. I don't know, like where how I feel about it, but this paper is pretty compelling with that. But where are the where are the stones, you know? Stones and all of the other material, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like kind of going with what David said, you don't find Clovis points on the other side of the Bering Strait. So if you have people coming in, with Clovis points, where they're coming from. So it's, you know, you know, part of that whole idea of, you know, we'll never, most likely never find the earliest expression. I mean, of a culture in general, because that's just statistics. And would we even recognize it if we did see the first, right? Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, with, with what Dr. Toon, you were saying, right? Like where, where's everything else? Where are these people going? And more importantly, if we do accept that the dated footprints at like 21, 22,000 years old are indeed human and not maybe a juvenile giant sloth sloshing around the swamp, possibly sloshed, how, how do you reconcile the 10,000 year gap? And that in, you know, 8,000, if you're to accept Monteverde, Verde, mm-hmm. that there's that once again, gap in time, it's clearly not as great as Saruti, which is, as we've discussed, fantastical in the <laughs> legend sense, as in mystical, as in very creative, not as in, oh my God, it's real. Where, where is everybody? Yeah. And I, this is not the same, the first time that this group has had this conversation and, and we've all had this conversation outside of this group as well. Right. And it's every time one of these, quote, early sites pops up, it doesn't fit any sort of pattern. Mm -hmm. And there's always gaps in time. And while that isn't necessarily something to point to and say, oh, well, it's not real because of that. But at a certain point, the dots have to start connecting into some kind of 
recognizable shape, right? I mean, we see patterns of human behavior, of dates, of archaeological sites in general around the world going back throughout the entire Pleistocene. But for some reason in the Americas, we get back beyond 13, 14,000 years and everything is unique and everything seems to be an outlier. Each individual site, you know, is unique and doesn't seem to relate in any way to anything else. And there's always these thousands and tens of thousands of years of missing people right after the fact. And that's just something that we have to to think about as a community, as an archaeological community, right? Uh, and, And what that means if some of these early sites are legitimate and are real and stand the test of time, then why here into the, in the Americas is it the only place in the world where we have these huge gaps in time? Yeah. That it's sparse is the word I, I, I often find myself using because it, it's just, yeah, like it, there's just gaps everywhere. I don't know like how else to describe it. Yeah. And um, I was going to say like, and this paper is less as Carlton mentioned, like less crazy than Sarudi or probably more, or better evidence than this cave in Mexico. But as you make these more uh, fantastical claims on, on, on certain pieces of data, you have to have the burden of the burden of proof is on you Mm -hmm. to prove that. And then to continue that research to say, okay, this is established. I mean, it just, it's not fair, obviously, but like, if you're going to say humans were here 200,000 years ago, that's, you you have a better argument for 26 or 23 than you have for 200,000. It's just math. It's just what yeah. we understand of the archaeological record. So it's, and like you guys had mentioned, this is kind of refreshing to see something that is plausible and they're trying to do their work. But I, and, but I think it's like going forward, I'm excited to see what comes out of this more than more than anything. Yeah, very much, right? I mean, I think at the end of the day, at least for me, I'm really interested in in the site and what this team is is doing and putting together and publishing. And I don't know, honestly, what to make of, of some of it, you know, like the, the definition of the toes and the morphology of some of the tracks and all of that. At the end of the day, you know, right now, uh, I'm, I'm just looking forward to the next bit of research to come out of this, uh, to, to get more information. Right. I mean, again, this is a science and we're always gathering more information to flesh out our interpretations more fully. And I'm more than happy to say, yeah, I was wrong. There's this new data set that, you know, really holds up and, you know, proves or does not, you know, disprove this, um, this seemingly far-fetched hypothesis. And, yeah, I'm just waiting for more information at this point because it's really intriguing. What about you, Dr. Miller? What are your thoughts? So it really makes me think about how we just approach these questions. And it really makes me think that we have some fundamental flaws. I had a friend of mine text me and he was like, you know, he, he said he would find the standards of evidence that that's that we operate by in paleobindian archaeology to be stifling and i come to the opposite conclusion i'm like it makes me realize that maybe a lot of archaeology out there is the inferences are just really really weak because they don't go through the ringer like we put our sites through when it comes to a question like this this is really like the cutting the cutting edge of like site formation theory and like, how do you find the earliest of something and how would you even know or even the math behind that? And we're, we keep running up against this problem to where the earliest of something and an outlier could essentially look like the same thing because we're trying to figure out whether a data point at the very, very, very end of the decay curve is legit or not. So it's not like looking at an outlier on a scatter plot or looking like an outlier in a normal distribution in stats. It's trying to find the outlier at a decay curve and a false positive and the earliest of something could essentially look the same. 
And so whenever people are like, well, you'll never be happy. You're looking for this. And if we find this, well, then you're going to need that. Well, if you find this and this, well, then, you know, you guys are going to want this, this, and this It's a never ending circle. It's like the, the comments from like, if you go back and read the dialogue between like Metacroft or Monteverde and why they stopped, they were like, I've already given you this, this, and this, you'll never be happy. What else could you want? And the reason is, is because the rest of us realize that the only way to tell whether this is the earliest of something or if it's a false positive is we have to look at that broader pattern. We have to look at the younger Dryas archaeological record and the early Holocene re- record and see if what comes before that makes sense. And Clovis makes sense. All right. What before that makes sense? How does that fit into the broader trend? And we have to rely on that to evaluate whether whether or not we're looking at something real or a false positive because it's not like a chemistry experiment. We can't control the parameters and keep rerunning the experiment to make sure that we got it right. We have to lean on this larger pattern of genetics and lithics and resource use and landscape use and all this other stuff. We have to put that all into a narrative. So, I mean, I think hopefully the authors will be like, if people keep asking us for X, Y, and Z, they think we're onto something and let's figure out a way to do it and not get frustrated and be like, we've showed you everything you need to, 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 to make a conclusion. And the other thing where I think that we even go about even putting this stuff out there, it's we're in the realm of like clickbait academia. So think about all the press articles that came out from this New York, or like New York Times. I must have gotten like you had like five or six in the folder. I must have seen different news outlets. Jesse and I got an email this morning from Popular Science wanting quotes. Now, imagine if these guys put this out there, they got all their ducks in a row and then they found something. They found that one thing that said, ah, shit, this isn't what we think it is. This puts them in a weird position of then having to turn around and being like, look, this is what we found. False alarm. This is what we think it is. Now we can add to knowledge for how you tell either this weird geochronology problem or this weird footprint problem or this weird reservoir effect problem, whatever. It puts them in an opposition because now they got all this press and universities and everybody screaming to the heavens about how the archaeologists for the last, you know, 70, 80 years have gotten it wrong. And now they're in this corner where they, I don't know. It just puts, it puts us in a weird position where we just can't say, look, man, we did our best shot. And then we found some data later and it says that we're wrong. Yeah. And, you know, I'll, I'll add to that too, talking about what these, the earliest of anything looks like, right? And how difficult that is. And this is not unique to the Americas either. I mean, we spend a lot of time arguing and debating and, and discussing these things in the Americas, but we see very similar things playing out anytime we're talking about new land masses being occupied by humans for the first time, right? In Madagascar, in Australia, in parts of Northern Europe and Ireland, right? These places that, you know, we have the ability today to to go after those questions of when did people first show up here and what does it look like? And it, it's, it's interesting taking that global perspective on some of this because it, it's really similar, um, the, the types of things that play out in all of these different areas. I, I, I just, one last thing I want to add is that it was wild that so many non-archaeologists brought this discovery up to me like all my friends who are not archaeologists did you hear about that thing in white sands did you hear about that thing in white sands and it's as as dr miller said that's i had to like put the caveat there like okay it says that but it's this is a scientific discipline we're going to keep trying to figure out what is happening there but how many i can only have that conversation so many times you can only have that conversation so many times to be like this is the context of what is going on there so it's which is why we're recording this so we can tell people go listen to our podcast so we so you can hear what we talk about it and uh, with that so we'll be right back with a special fourth segment right here on the special ATM. fourth is <laughs> <laughs> welcome back to episode 76 of a life in ruins podcast we're here with dr jesse tune and dr shane miller so connor ended the last segment talking about how 
first off, we're archaeologists, but like everyone and their mother sends us the article, be like, have you seen this? And it's obviously we have. Uh, so just putting that on the record. But also when we are like, yeah, but let's wait for the rebuttal study to come out. We just look like a dick, like all the time when we say that, because we just look, you know, like we're a stick in the mud about stuff. And then there's the whole narrative about, you know, no one wants to admit that there were people here earlier than that in, in the, you know, in North America. And a lot of people are wise to that. And it's a genuinely huge trend on the internet. So when this comes out, everyone shares it all over, like Shane was saying, and it, it just goes everywhere. But like, if somebody were to have a new study on Tylenol and how it's like, you know, there's a new brand of it. That's great. It doesn't make New York times news, nor does the rebuttal studies to it. But because this is our human past and it's so like buzzwordy, everybody sees it. And like, I don't know, I guess, I guess my point going with this would be like, at what point do we have to reassess like how much like we have biases, I guess, because when these come out, my initial gut reaction sometimes is to be like, and that's, that can't be real. And then I look at it, but other sites like Shane brought up a great point. I've dug early archaic sites and been like, yeah, this is legit, but I don't like ever question it. I'm rambling now, but like, what do we do? No, but I think that's right. That speaks to like a comfortability that our field has where if something pops up that's beyond our comfort zone, we intend to, as, as you know, Shane was alluding to, we, we criticize it f- not out of necessarily spite, maybe for some folks, but really to give, put it through the ringer in terms of the rigor. Yeah. And, and like what you were saying, David, when we were in our little group text, I found out like it was my, my tippo, Matt Reed, who sent me the proof of the article. Cause apparently for the past two, three years, those folks have been working with descendant communities about these footprints and keeping them in the loop and talking to them about it for, for a while now. So for some reason, my NAGPRA coordinator was out in New Mexico. I think it has something to do with the Apaches taking Pawnees as slaves and bring them to New Mexico. So technically we have to be associated. So fun fact, Whoa. But I'll all that out. out. When I, yeah, when I, when I, when yeah. I on the next yes. episode of a life <laughs> podcast, we, we suss that out. <laughs> but when it came to this paper, all I could talk about was, was the Bayesian they used in the dating methods. Cause that's what I do. And I can say, you know, bringing in that secondary dating method with the uranium is far more rigorous than I am with the things that I build in the planes. Cause I don't, I don't need to do that. But for something like this, you know, it's important to have, yeah. You know, it's like Robert Baratheon is like, you know, how many armies are the strongest? And he's like one. And it's <laughs> the combining of all these different threads of evidence to make one tight strand makes for the better argument. So I can see why that's why that's done here. And, yeah. you know, kind of comparing these earlier sites and, and the types of data and, and the debates that we're having to more recent sites and, and kind of what you all have been saying, oftentimes with Holocene sites that are much more recent, there's more data to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. There's automatically more lines of, of evidence pointing to, you know, similar conclusions. Whereas these earlier Pleistocene sites, we don't have very much to begin with. So we can get real creative with how we are approaching these questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to say, I think I, there are these smaller debates on smaller scales that you, you will see happening in different aspects of archaeology. So you'll have folks in the late prehistoric who are having these beefs and going back and forth and and being rigorous. And there's, I think, all that stuff exists. It's just not in the spotlight like the Mm -hmm. Mm Paleo-Indian stuff is. Because I know folks who dislike each other passionately and will write reviews about each other or editorials, you know, like that that all happens. It's just on, on a different stage, essentially. And I lost my train of thought with the Tylenol comment, but like when somebody like a a study comes out criticizing a new Tylenol study, no one cares, you know, like that's not on anyone's radar, but you would want somebody to make sure that the medicine you're getting over the counter isn't going to serode your liver. But when it comes to like human dispersal into the Americas, when someone is critical of, of a study, the same kind of scientific process, we just look like you know, curmudgeons that hold on to it. And it's just, it's just interesting how like it's just not seen that way. I think there's like some weird, broader sociological stuff that we're also on the margins of like, like we make jokes about like 
Mulder and Scully and X-Files. But like there's a reason that show was popular and it was born out of a mistrust of government that like and conspiracy theories. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you think about like how many times you guys are subjected on your social media every day about about very like David sent me screenshots of yeah like all his people that come after him about oh. I don't know everything from Atlantis to whatever and there's like this and then you look at like I brought it up earlier but like vaccines and anti vaxxers and like all this other stuff there and it's like I think it's like the same processes and it's like the same belief that somehow there's like this cabal of us who are trying to subject to, to suppress the truth about the peopling of the Americas. Yeah. Uh, when most of, most of the times it's just, we just want to know. And we put a lot of work and effort into this and we want to know why something doesn't fit and what's more likely a false positive or that something is 10,000 years older than the most unequivocal archeological record for something being early in the Americas. So I find that incredibly frustrating and, you know, and then also how we actually talk to each other about this. Like I look at the previous generation of people doing this and like the animosity some people mm-hmm. have for each other. And like, there are some people that like, I, I have like very differing views on the peopling of the Americas that I just, I, I really like a lot. Like, and I'll just use an example Jesse Halligan and I, like she is a very big pre-Clovis comp- proponent. She was the one who dug Paige Latson. It's a pre-Clovis site. She's an underwater archaeologist. It is all on board with the coastal route. And I'm lean the other way. And, and, and we can have conversations and they're productive without them being antagonistic. And I, I don't, I wish we put more effort into that of like being learning how to critique each other without being jerks about it. Yeah. I thought you were going to say Jesse tune at first and I was like, Oh shit. (laughs) Yeah. No. (laughs) Well, Jesse tune and I like, so we have our own group text and it's me and Jesse tune, Ashley Smallwood, Tom Jennings and Derek Anderson. And that's like our COVID like, Let's pretend the world outside is not burning and let's talk about the Pleistocene where it was cold. <laughs> it's my and, happy place. And we all disagree on a lot of stuff. Like, like for example, like I think I'm the only one of that group that probably thinks that people were the main driver for Pleistocene extinctions. And yet we all have conversations about it and there's stuff that comes up in that conversation that's made me change my mind on some things. So mm-hmm. I don't know, man. I, 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 the art of the art of constructive criticism and good natured debate is lost in some ways. It feels like, but maybe it's making a comeback. Maybe, maybe our generation and and the TikTokers are going to get better at this. Maybe it's just the boomers that ruined it, and like everything else, we're left to pick up the pieces. Do you, Something um, that I've always wanted to do, like, because I mean, we've talked about this before. Like, I, I don't do Paleo Indian. Like, I, I enjoy it because of my Wyoming roots. I'm familiar with it. I have no stake in this game. But something that I've, I've noticed through doing the indigenous archaeology thing is that, I mean, in general, there are not many indigenous archaeologists in the field. We've talked about that. But something that I would have liked to see, because when, and this isn't criticizing my colleagues, there's when the sites come up, when we talk about pre-Clovis, there's this initial gravitation towards, well, we've always been here and we start getting into indigenous beliefs on place and origin. But with that, I would like to see more work on either by or with indigenous folk on Pleistocene stories because they, they do exist. Like I've talked about on this podcast where we have Pawnee traditions and record traditions that talk about an age of monsters, a time of cold and dark and ice and like pretty clearly the Pleistocene and Pleistocene megafauna and glaciers like they exist. And it's just treating the tra- those oral traditions like you would any historic document. And I'd like to see a narrative with different nations across the country looking at those same stories to kind of figure out where everyone's at. Cause I think when we do talk about peopling of the Americas or some of these old sites where they are, like it is important that there is 
we are as anthropologists talking about people, right? Mm-hmm. We're not talking about footprints in this episode. That's the evidence, but we're talking about people. People had to make those. The Clovis points, people had to make them and use them. Mm-hmm. And especially, and this, it's not just paleo Indian archaeology, but there is a lack and it's maybe it's definitely not on purpose. It's just the way things are. We don't consider those things. And so having like some, a database or volume of like, okay, what do, what do indigenous folk think and how do we use this to help work being done? It doesn't just have to be paleo Indian, but you know, through time mm-hmm. and space, cause these are the lived experiences of people. And we know, you know, from stories like, what is it? Gilgamesh is the oldest written story. Uh, I think. Western that, canon, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we do know that stories can persist through thousands of years and remain relatively un, unmodified. Because I like, for, even from my perspective, I just know the Pawnee and Arikara thing. So I don't try to speak for anyone else on coastal hypothesis or anything else. I'm pretty firm and like, you know what? I'm pretty sure my ancestors 12,000 years ago probably did come through the ice free corridor because that's what we talk about. And we just get mm-hmm. dumped onto the plains and we don't ever leave Nebraska. <laughs> so, <laughs> <It's unfortunate. laughs> here's my my thoughts on on that is just the logistics of it and and here's every every person that i've worked that i know that works for a tribe whether they're working in the office or the tipo themselves they're tapped out they are they're they're literally fifth gear going down the interstate at 120 miles an hour and a Honda Accord with the RPMs pegged out. Like they, <laughs> they are doing everything they can to keep it on the road, right? With limited funding. It's it's not like they have unlimited resources, unlimited staff, and they're doing the best they can. And a lot of what they got to handle is Section 106 and Section 110 stuff. And so it's like... I call on the phone and I call and I'll, I'll just name drop somebody out of the, like if I call up cause I'm in Chickasaw country, right? Like this is, you know, I'm like right at the boundary of the Chickasaw and Choctaw ancestral lands I call up Karen Brunzo. And I'm like, Hey Karen, I've got this ice age idea. You should be really stoked about it. You should get in on this. And she's going to be like, I've got way too much stuff to do right now to, to go on this flight of fancy. But if I'm like, Yo, Karen, hey, I got a student who's interested in doing Southeastern archaeology. Where can we help you guys the most? Can you think of a project that would make your life easier? It's a lot easier for Karen to think of something and devote her time, her very limited, precious resource of time towards something. And I think it's just maybe it's on us for not making those questions relatable and on the forefront of stuff that's going to be relevant to the, to tribal groups. But also, man, it's just the reality. I think of man, just sometimes the things that we privilege as being the most interesting things that one could possibly study are not at the forefront of their needs at the time. So if it, if it happens, it happens. If I get that phone call one time from Karen and she's like, Hey, we're interested in paleo Indian stuff. I'm going to be so pumped, but I know the reality is most of the time when I call her, it's going to be like, for example, I got a student working on his proposal to look at historic sites that were probably overlooked that or listed as historic sites that were probably Chickasaw homesteads pre-removal. And so that's more inter- like they actually know who those people were who own those lands that are connected directly to their to their people on their tribal roles. And that's going to be way more pertinent to them right now than what happened 10, 20,000 years ago. Carlton mentioned earlier, like how his Pawnee, you know, um, mm-hmm. ancestors moved across. They're not in the same place they used to be. So when I'll get comments on my, my Instagram, which is a fair point and criticism, like, what do you like? Why don't you ask what the indigenous have to say? And like, I often like am guilty of making like, you know, just indigenous thought a monolith, but like, when I want to present the alternative theory to the peopling of the Americas, how do I give the creation story of a hundred and some different nations that are all different? Like you would get very tired of my account and unfollow me after like 30 of them. Yeah. So like, what do we do with that? 
yeah, like Car- Carlton, how do we how do we solve this riddle, man? Like from like not I mean not I'm not asking you to be like the spokesperson for all Indigenous America, but like for like just just narrow it down, just like just the Pawnee and your experiences with their tribal organization, like yeah, no, I mean, and this is what I work with. I think what you talked about hinted at uh, Shane with collaboration taking you know working with an indigenous community is a really really good step especially with like grad students and undergrads i think that's excellent like how can you help out sweet help answer questions for tribes that they they need karen is a listener of the show and karen is an absolute beast when it comes to archaeology and the work that she does so huge shout out to karen you know we get into really quickly in my experience like tribal dynamics and uh, the folks, my TIPO, NACPR officer, culture resource division director, they're elders. There, there is a, there's a cultural uh, protocol that I have to follow a lot of times. And so much I can say. And so much I can do. Um, even within working within my own community. And that's the way I want it to be. You know, I'm, I'm of service to them. And when it comes to talking about origins to be frank, like even though, you know, I'd, I'd like to see indigenous folks do it and synthesize all the all the traditions and see who says what. I don't think the relationship between archaeology and indigenous communities is as strong as it needs to be in order for those conversations to happen mm-hmm. fundamentally, because you really do get into when you especially and this it's not just for indigenous folks, right? Like if you talk to evangelical Christians or other groups who are very firm in their beliefs no matter what the science says, you know, it's not going to, to change their mind. So with that being said, it is a landmine even for indigenous archaeologists and indigenous peoples themselves working within the field to navigate. And, and what can we do? You know, um, what, I, what I have seen out of this article and what we've talked about with the social media results and, and the talk is that there are people on social media and tribes are coming out to talk about those origin stories on their own. You know, it might not be like a full in-depth American antiquity article. It might just be a Facebook post, but like we can, I can start already seeing what people are thinking about it and how it fits into their worldview, which is still cool to see in and itself. You know, I, I specifically work within the last 1000 years to avoid these conversations, <laughs> you know, maybe later, but, uh, but I'm sure you, you got your own landmines in the last 1000 years that you got to navigate with oral history. I mean, it's yeah, not- try telling, try telling Lakotas they weren't always in South Dakota. Cause that's a, that's always a fun conversation. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> yeah. And I think on that landmine, we have to end this episode. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Toon and Dr. Miller for coming back and, and chatting with us about this. I, I, f- I feel like we'll see you again <laughs> in the next year when they drop another article or someone else does too. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us on. Yeah. And we'll have, we'll take your guys' contact information from the last times you were on, as well as all the sources that we talked about will be found in the descriptions for everyone to, to follow along. And I guess we're going to stay stay tuned for for maybe what happens next maybe we we do find out these are juvenile sloth footprints stay jesse tuned stay jesse tuned (laughs) (laughs) jesse what are your final thoughts for our listeners well i probably said something similar to this last time but it's kind of where i typically fall taking a step back after these really fascinating and deep conversations with you all but we're in the business of carefully balancing healthy skepticism with an open mind as we are pushing back dates and looking at questions of outliers versus the last data point on a decay curve. And we just have to kind of keep that in mind, right? That it's a balancing game between skepticism and open-mindedness. I think that's, yeah, that's well said. I'm just going to loop back around to what I said earlier and the archaeology is really, really young in terms of like how we know what we know about the past. It's ridiculously young. Um, We're still figuring stuff out. If you think about like one of the things that I talked about, like looking at the broader patterns and relying on ancient DNA, that's like what, 
10, 15 years old we've been at that. Most of our literature and geoarchaeology was really hit the mainstream about the time that I was born. You know, like Folsom was found about the time that my grandparents were born. So like this is we're still trying to figure this out. And this might be one of these examples of footprints and where we're, we're still trying to figure out exactly how you actually lay out the body of evidence and create a good case that what you have is legit or not. And um, they might come out with an article the next time around or a follow up or an answer to a critique that just puts the nail in the coffin and they might have it and we're left at the drawing board. Or we might just find out that there might be alternative explanations. And that's OK, too, because we're just all figuring it out with the best data set that we have at hand. And they're always going to be imperfect data sets. The happy little trees. <laughs> it's also well said, <laughs> Dr. Ross. Well, I guess there we can end it. Guys, please be sure to rate and review the podcast. This one was solid. I think this was, you know, NPR worthy. So maybe not, but <laughs> give us give us a review. Give it just one star would be great. And yeah, follow us on the socials. All right. Well, on that note, let's post this episode to Instagram and we'll see you next week. <laughs>for listening to a life in ruins podcast you can follow us on instagram and facebook at a life in ruins podcast and you can also email us at a life in ruins podcast at gmail.com and remember make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer so what rock group has four men that didn't sing neandertalica mount rushmore Oh my God! Oh, <laughs> that, that's Carson Black who sent that to that to us. So. Thank oh, you, man. Carson. <sighs> yeah. Oh um, that and, is with, well. and with that, we're out. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.